Coming up next on All About Android, it's me, Jason Howell, my co-host Ron Richards, and our guest Michelle Rahman from XDA Developers. We have a lot to talk about. So many great news stories in today's show, including Android 12.1. Michelle has the exclusive hands-on with the version of Android that's coming after the next version of Android. It's all focused on making Android even more of a foldable OS. That plus Pixel features being opened up for everyone, USB-C being more of a standard for everyone, at least if the EU has its way. Uh, I review the WiseBuds Pro True Wireless Earbuds. Uh, Calendar is the, is the latest Google app to get messaging. YouTube TV loses NBC. And I'm not even talking about all this other news we have to talk about. It is jam-packed tonight on All About Android. That's up next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hello and welcome to All About Android, episode 544, recorded on Tuesday, September 28th, 2021. Your weekly source for the latest news, hardware, and apps for the Android faithful. I'm Jason Howell. And I'm Ron Richards. Oh, yeah. And yeah, remember... Welcome. Welcome back. Flashback to last week. Flo uh, informed us that she's not going to be on the show for a couple of months here. So we already miss you, Flo. But that just means that like we have to fill your shoes with other people. And this week, we got an awesome people to fill those shoes with. And that people is actually a person. It's Michelle Rahman from XDA Developers. Welcome back to the show, Michelle. Glad to be back, Jason. Always good to have you on. Actually, had you on uh, Tech News Weekly a couple of weeks ago to talk about the the Google uh, Tensor chip that we're gonna get. Oh, that apparently my device <laughs> liked that word. Um, it's like, yeah, Tensor, really? You want to cool. talk about it? Sign it's really exci- <laughs> my Pixel Five is really excited for the Pixel Six, apparently. But anyways, everyone should uh, check out uh, TNW uh, Tech News Weekly from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you really broke it all down as far as the Tensor chip is concerned. And I, before we kind of jump into things, I just got to say, you guys are killing it right now. It seems like every year leading up to, you know, either the, the big hardware announcement or the, the new version of Android, someone, you know, some outlet seems to get like many of the leaks and everything. And it really seems like you guys have, have got that. You've captured this because apparently you have a source that has the device and that's a pretty valuable asset asset to have this early on in the game. Pretty awesome. Well, definitely a bit of luck, a bit of knowing where to look. And yeah, it's just, <laughs> you can't, you really can't predict these kind of things. Like, it's yeah. not like I was uh, expecting to have a Pixel 6 Pro source reach out to me. It just kind <laughs> of happened on the day of the Apple event of all days. That is amazing. We kind of threw our team for a loop. <laughs> And yeah, no kidding. And you, can't, and you can't look a gift horse in the mouth. You got to be ready and willing and accept that when it happens, right? So good, good for you for being prepared, right? Not being yeah, distracted exactly. by Apple. So <laughs> <laughs> exactly, cool. Well, it's always great to get you on, Michelle, and, uh, and Michelle will be here for the uh, for the duration of the episode. But we're going to be talking about a lot of um, his exclusives as well. So why don't we just get right into it? Let's start, Burke. With the news. Today I got nothing again. I'm sorry. <laughs> Something well, about what? Uh, not even gonna go there. You know, it's okay. <laughs> Sometimes we have those days where we got nothing. <laughs> I thought I've I had, had a new scriptwriter hired, and then he failed me, so uh, I fired him. You can't depend on people, Burke. That's the thing. No, you gotta it, do it yourself. I'd like it's, to. Totally. Artist, I really would. Like you, you're not quite at the Warhol level of where you can have a bunch of people working for you in a factory. So true. Like I wish. Me, yeah, yeah. yeah. So just like someday. snap my fingers. Yeah, yep. that'd be great. Or I could just be creative <laughs> enough to not need anybody else. But you'll get there. I'm confident. <sighs> you could do it. All right. So let's start off with one of these exclusives here. I put at the top of the news rundown, Android 12.1, although you all, you do specify in your write-up about this, Michelle, that it could not be 12.1. We haven't seen a point release in Android in quite some time, I think since Oreo. Um, but 
nonetheless, like whatever Google calls it, this would be the update that comes after the update that we're all expecting to happen sometime in the next couple of weeks. We're going to get the official release of Android 12. That's going to come at the head of whatever the device announcement is for the Pixel 6 and the 6 Pro and anything else Google has up its sleeve. Android 12.1 is the thing that comes after the thing that we're waiting for, which is kind of impressive that you have as much insight into it as you do. So, you know, you, you called this a hands-on, which it really was. You've got video. You Basically, you did what XDA does so well. You took this thing that nobody thought they'd see yet and you and you brought it to life because you know how to work the code behind the scenes to make that happen. So, um, so that's amazing. Obviously, this is focused mostly on foldables, I would say. But from your perspective, since you're the one that wrote all the, you know, all of this um, exclusive up and you did the hands on, like, what would you say are the standout features, um, you know, maybe a couple of the features that really kind of catch your attention and make you think like, OK, this this means something going forward. So I'd say the number one standout feature in Android 12.1 um, is the new taskbar. It's a feature you see all the time in various desktop operating systems, Windows, Mac OS, et cetera. That little bar at the bottom that has your apps that you can launch just by clicking on it, um, that seems to be in the works for 12.1. Uh, and wow. In Android, you'll be able to tap on app icons to launch them, um, long press and then drag and drop to one of the sides to open split screen view. And you'll also oh. be able to dock it by long pressing on the taskbar. So it's not like a groundbreaking feature, but Android for the longest time has had rudimentary support for large screen devices like tablets and now big screen foldables. And this is this operating system update is laying the groundwork to better support those kinds of devices. I think that was that was one of my primary questions after kind of reading through this is, you know, it, a recurring topic on this show, and actually we have an email later that's exactly about this, is Google's, you know, creating the tablet ecosystem on Android and then completely and not supporting it at all to the point to where now, and we've gotten some emails to correct us and say, hey, there's actually a lot of tablets out there. There may be, but it's pretty obvious that Google's Google's kind of priority is not around the tablet experience. It's always been around the phone, um, you know, primarily between phones and tablets. Tablets have always sat in the backseat and, and not got the attention that they deserve. So obviously this update it seems very focused on foldables, but in essence, that also and it sounds like this is what you're saying. It also seems to address some of the shortcomings of tablets. Do you think this could be, you know, part of Google's strategy is maybe a revitalization of the tablet, uh, their tablet efforts, or really, it's just all about the foldables because we know about the Pixel folds that are on the horizon. So I still think that. Google doesn't really care about tablets at all. Um, yeah. But to be fair, the work they're doing to improve the experience on foldable phones directly translates to an improved experience for tablets. Because right. as you can see in a lot of the images and the videos that I posted, a lot of those features will work just as well on a tablet as they would on a big foldable. Um, yeah, no there's question. functionally no difference between the Galaxy Z Fold 3 when it's unfolded versus the tablet besides the aspect ratio. The Z Fold 3, even um, Android treats it as a tablet whenever it's unfolded. It's considered mm -hmm. a tablet by apps. Um, certain apps like Google Chrome open in tablet mode where you can see the tabs up top. So it's basically just a tablet. And all of these features that are being worked on for 12.1, even though they're aimed at foldables, they'll also translate really nicely to tablets. And even Jason, though Google did... doesn't really care about tablets very much, I think we're definitely seeing like a resurgence in tablets, like in the Android ecosystem. A few years ago, there was just Samsung and yeah. the occasional Huawei tablet. But now you have like some really high end premium tablets from Xiaomi, the, the, the Xiaomi Pad 5 series. You have Realme doing their first tablet. You have Motorola about gearing up to announce their first tablet. You have HMD Global announcing the Nokia tablet. Um, like they're teasing that for next week. So there's a whole bunch of tablets that are coming to the ecosystem, and it seems like um, 
you know, people are finally listening. And Google, even if they're not, even if they're not directly addressing the tablet ecosystem, the changes they're making will definitely help. And Jason, wasn't I, wasn't I saying this a couple of weeks ago or, or very recently, like with the foldables and things like that, that it's essentially, you know, we, we are seeing a, a odd tablet resurgence with foldables, right? Because like mm-hmm. this, this is what they're doing. And so like, Michelle, I think it's really interesting that you say that you don't think Google gives a darn about tablets, but they do give a darn about foldables because they're adjusting for it. And it's basically the same. I mean, it's yeah. So I, I, I think I think these things could bode well for tablets because we are seeing a resurgence in tablets. So, yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. We could, yeah, we could really see that uh, translate. And yeah. one one thing that um, stood out for me also in reading through your hands on was the the part about open sourcing the Monet uh, wallpaper theming engine. Talk a little bit about that. Like, why? What's notable about that? Why is that notable? So um, if for those of you who are aren't aware, in Android 12, there's a new theming engine that's codenamed Monet. Um, you might see it publicly described as dynamic colors. What happens is that the theme system um, extracts colors from your wallpaper, and it generates a palette of rich pastel colors um, that are then applied to various parts of the system UI. And those um, colors are exposed to apps through an API that they can use to apply to their own uh, user interfaces. So um, whenever you apply a wallpaper in Android 12 on a Pixel device, a lot of Google apps will apply that same color scheme to their own UIs. And you'll also see that same color scheme applied to the settings, to the quick settings panel, et cetera. Um, The caveat, though, is that this only works currently on Pixel devices because Google's algorithm for generating um, a color palette based on the colors that are extracted from a wallpaper is currently proprietary. It's not included in the open source repository for Android 12. However, that's going to change in the future because the Monet theme engine will be fully open sourced with the release of 12.1. It's currently included in Google's internal source code repositories, which is not public yet. Um, But once 12.1 is publicly released, then that source code will be public as well. So then any device that's released or that upgrades to 12 that isn't a Pixel device prior to this, are they not going to be able to play with uh, with the dynamic theming? It's That's just an interesting revelation to me because... That's so much of what I identify Android 12 as being. Like, that's such a critical component of it. But if it's just, that's Android 12 for Pixel devices right now, that's that's kind of a different story. I mean, it certainly sets Pixel devices apart, but are they going to be able to play in this playing field before this update, do you think? Or is that going to be off limits to them? So Google with Monet theming system is definitely a critical component of Material U, which is Google's new design language. Right. Um, as for how it will appear on devices from other smartphone makers, that will depend on how much effort that smartphone maker goes to implementing their own system. Um, because Monet is not fully open source, but many components of it are, OEMs can't just copy and paste Google's code and have user wallpapers generate themes on their own devices. They'll have to... Um, fill in the gaps and come up with a code for generating palettes mm. on their own. So they could come up with their own wallpaper based theming system, but they'd have to do a little bit of legwork and it's up in the air. To, you know, who knows which OEMs will bother doing, will bother doing yeah. that as, as far as we can see, Samsung hasn't done that yet with their, um, one UI four beta, but right. we haven't really seen many other Android 12 betas yet. So we can't really tell if others will follow suit. Interesting. All right. Well, yeah, now I'm, now I'm curious too. It would be interesting to see Samsung come out with the Android 12 and it's just kind of looks like all of their other versions. Meanwhile, you've got Android 12 on the pixel that looks completely different from everything else uh, because of this like marquee feature, the material you dynamic theming, you know, that, that whole aspect. Um, so I think that's, that's notable. 
Um, cool. Yeah. Anything that we're leaving out that you think is important to mention here before we move on? Well, besides the taskbar, there are also other UI changes that will improve the experience on foldables and big screen tablets like the dual pane settings panel, the dual dual pane settings app, the dual pane notifications and quick settings, and the dual pane um, lock screen view. And the, the lock screen pin and password input will slide to the left or right depending on where you tap on the screen to unlock the phone or to unlock the tablet. So a lot of these smaller UI changes will make the experience definitely better on big screen devices because right now all these elements are just kind of centered and they're basically just like blown up phone UI. So they look kind of terrible on tablets right. and foldables. Right. Right. Oh, you gotta love that. That thing did that, that it seems to never go away. Um, cool. Uh, well, this is, uh, this is something to look forward to. Obviously, we're going to have to look forward to it because this is not the next version. This is the version after the next version. Uh, kind of crazy that you have so much insight into the version coming after we this can version. Ne- we can never yeah. just sit and be content with what we've got. I know. You know like, you it's know, so yeah. true. So there's always, there's all, <laughs> so we're always true. looking in the future. No, it's good. It's good to know that it's coming. And and it's it's actually, I think it's really interesting that we haven't seen a point one. I don't know. I don't remember the last yeah. time we saw a point one. They, like, I feel Gloria. like it was like, like, yeah, Oreo. Yeah, I feel like that was the last time there was like a notable point one. So it's interesting. But yeah. um, but so ahead of that, moving on, uh, last week, actually, Google announced a number of Android features rolling out to all devices without the need to update to Android 12, um, which is interesting because usually, you know, like a lot of that is uh, they tie into the latest and greatest. But here we are. I feel like this is two weeks in a row where we're, uh, you know, Google is just handing stuff out to previous versions. Um, so for, for this latest gift, uh, all Android devices will get some Pixel features for the first time, including heads up in digital well-being, uh, warning when walking while using your phone, uh, the locked folder in Google Photos. Uh, Gboard will now extract phone numbers, email addresses, and links in items as you copy them. Uh, Gboard also stores recent screenshots. And Gboard gets the Pixel Smart Compose, which is a feature in Android 11 and higher. Um, and as for accessibility features that we thought might be part of the Android 12 release, uh, camera switches uses front-facing camera to detect facial gestures for device control. And Project Activate uses those facial gestures to fire off shortcuts and tasks, which is great that they're rolling that, that that's not going to be Android 12 specific. That's going to all Android. That's any accessibility thing is great. Um, yeah. Also, great. nearby share now has an everyone setting. Um, and just be careful if you turn that on and opening it up for all to share too, because that could be dangerous. Um, Google TV, I, I saw a lot of people talking about this and I saw a lot of uh, demos and things like that, but Google TV built a remote control into the Google TV app um, so you can say goodbye to that old Android TV remote app, thank God. Um, so we do get an update uh, yeah. there if you have a Google TV. Um, and now finally, smart hubs can now display reminders with with the uh, command, hey G, open my reminders. Um, so that's a lot of stuff that they are uh, dishing out to the rest of the Android ecosystem. Michelle, what, why do you think the change from like making this stuff part of you know either pixel specific or latest and greatest Android version specific, aside from the accessibility stuff, which I think they should always do make, you know, retroactive. But why do you think that they're rolling all this stuff out to previous versions? Well, the thing is a lot of these features don't require specific APIs or new features Mm -hmm. introduced in Android 12, for example. So there's no technical reason why they would need to limit them to newer versions. Google could do the awful thing and limit all of these features to Pixel phones running Android 12, and that would piss off everyone in the tech blogosphere. Um, but I think a lot of these features are genuinely useful, you know, accessibility features or safety features like the heads up and digital well-being. That you know, there's no reason to limit it to Pixel phones running Android 12. So why not roll it out to everyone? They did actually yeah. limit that feature. For a few months, that feature was Pixel exclusive. So, mm-hmm. so they do do that. A lot of these features were Pixel exclusive for a few months. So Pixel users still get that benefit of having uh, these new features before many other people um, for a few months at least. Yeah. Yeah. You took the words right out of my mouth. I was going to point that out as well. And this seems to be a recurring kind of thing that Google does. The Pixel will get these features. Everyone goes, oh my goodness, that's amazing that the Pixel can do this. You can only get this on the Pixel. 
But then in the back of my mind, I'm at the point now where when I see those, I'm like, okay, yeah, but eventually it's going to end up on other phones. Like eventually Google kind of opens it up and makes way for the new set of like exclusive pixel features uh, that won't hit other devices. Did they ever open up um, the now playing feature? That's just like exclusive to Pixel, I think. I don't think they ever push that out to other devices. And there might be a technical reason as far as why that is. But so there are some features that just go exclusive uh, to Pixel, but... Um, we do see this a lot. Um, and, and maybe it's the, the, the features that are like really focused on like safety, you know, like the heads up feature, that's a safety feature, accessibility features, that's accessibility. That's going to, you know, make a lot of people very happy on all devices. So, you know, it could just be the, the type of these features, um, as far as what Google chooses to just let everybody have versus kind of keeping it for themselves. And, um, yeah, and I'm very happy to know that the Android TV remote app is going away. <laughs> <'Cause> yeah. That, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's a, that's my nice goodness. Blessing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the, the times when I absolutely have to use it, like, I'm happy that it's there and that I can use it because, you know, I've lost my remote or it's not working or whatever. So it's nice to know that I can but I really never want to actually use it. So uh, I haven't used the uh, the built-in remote in the Google TV app though. So I don't know if it's any better. <laughs> it might just be yeah. the same, <laughs> but. I got to imagine it's better. I can't imagine they would roll something out that wasn't improved a little bit, but. Uh, well, yeah. And especially on the Google TV app, which is actually a pretty nicely designed app. They did a really good job with that app. Um, I should point out Scooter X in chat uh, linked to a uh, XDA developers uh, page. Uh, from April of this year with the now playing feature had been ported to other devices. So that's, but I don't think that's, no, that's not an that official port. Now an official. Yeah. So important to know that Google did not roll out now playing to other devices, but as is usually is often the case, XDA, you know, uh, developers in the, in the forums and everything, uh, people who are very active on XDA are really good at modifying these APKs and, and porting them to other devices and stuff. So uh, it's one of the many things that I love about XDA. You guys are smart. Uh, and finally, um, uh, this is a quick one, but I think it's interesting. The EU is planning to enforce or require smartphone makers to use USB-C uh, ports on their devices. Obviously, it really seems like this is this is uh, aimed more at companies like Apple. They've got their own proprietary port, and uh, you know the EU wants uh, in you know in an effort of reducing e-waste and complexity and all this stuff. They want everybody to get on the USB-C train. Many, dare I say, most Android phones now are USB-C. I mean, I don't know if it's if it's kosher to say most at this point, because I don't actually know. But I mean, any any of the devices that I get floating by me nowadays all have USB C. Um, if you're if you're finding a USB A port on an Android device, you know it's either older or maybe you know it's it's a really inexpensive device. It could be, um, but you're just not seeing it as much anymore. I don't know if USB-C has become even more of a standard on Android, but I certainly hope so. But this would um, this would apply to smartphones, also tablets, headphones, speakers, like portable speakers, uh, game consoles, cameras. They're also pushing for fast charging standards to make them um, interoperable. So that's interesting. And if this is passed, manufacturers will have 24 months to comply. 24 months strikes me as a really fast turnaround, but maybe that's the... The amount of time. Well, I mean, it takes, twenty-four you know, months is from, twenty-four months is two years. I mean, that's a that's a long time. I mean, yeah, I suppose so. I, I don't know how fast stuff. this stuff works. It was yeah. funny because I was talking about this with some friends of mine who happen to be uh, iOS users, and they're like, "Oh, the EU overreach again." And I was like, "Well, no, actually, I, I you know, like I, I think a proprietary connector is a little, you know, kind of users hostile." Um, yeah. And this kind of this kind of, we talked about this in the opening of the show. There was a there was a intense discussion in the in the Discord recently about our attitude towards Apple and iOS and all that sort of stuff. Um, but like. I, you know, and 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 while the person who made those comments, I respect their comments, and and I'm and I, I never want to say anything that turns you off in terms of what we think of Apple and that sort of thing. It's things like this 
like the the proprietary proprietary connector and the need for the reliance on it what what is seen as a competitive advantage because you know Apple will claim they have developed their own technology and they're you know it's used for a reason and all this sort of stuff but you know going back to you know going back to the days of just like universal the whole point of USB is you the for, the U stands for universal right like there there's a there's a um there's a concept of making cables and things like this in a way where it doesn't matter who the manufacturer is and making it standard that does benefit more people you know the, you know wider and the, and the challenge should be how do you innovate within that standard and how do you give back to the community and you yeah. know that is often where I'm at odds with Apple because it seems that you know and this is where you know like I subscribe we talked about this on the show in the past I subscribe to a Gene Roddenberry like future where technology is is omnipresent and everything works and there's no uh, you know everything in Star Trek uses the same glowing connectors and things like that. You never run into like, oh, I we need the type D connector. Darn it. You know, like there's no because mm -hmm, because there's mm -hmm. no capitalism there. Like that's the problem. Capitalism is at odds with a, you know, with a uh, more universal support everybody approach. And 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 then the and the EU loves to overreach. We've seen what they've done at Microsoft. We've seen what they've done at Google. But I saw this and I was like, oh, this is I, I am I'm actually I, I'm not against this. I'm I'm I support them on this one. So yeah. Now yeah, feel free to I shoot me down, Michelle. I'm I'm sure you probably have opinions, yeah. but like I I yeah, I'd love to hear. Wrong, them. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> Michelle, what do you think about this? So I think a key part of the EU's directive that sets it apart from, or that actually makes it somewhat reasonable, is um, how it addresses the issue of updating the directive over time. So you know, when, whenever the the government or any government issue some kind of rule or law or directive pertaining to technology, you're always worried, you know, oh, they're going to be outdated. The technology is going to outpace them in, in right. five or so years. You know, there's no chance. They're just going to stifle innovation. But if you read the EU's directive, they made it very clear that they want the te technology companies like the USB implementers forum to come up with standards. And if those standards supersede like USB-C, then the EU has set up like a way for it to quickly adopt those new standards into its mm. new requirement. And so like that kind of solves the issue of, you know, are they stifling innovation? I would say they aren't because they've, you know, they want companies to come together and come up with stand new standards, adopt those standards, and the EU will then adopt those standards themselves and make it the new requirement in the future. Yeah, it would be one thing if, if they were like, yeah, USB-C for life, <laughs> forever. <laughs> right. yeah. Damn any new any new uh, advancements in this technology space, because the most important thing is that we're all on the same connector together. Um, but uh, that's a really great point uh, that, that you that you mentioned there. Um, having some sort of future future guidance, future you know view into the future and what technology is inevitably going to do over time, there will be at some point a, a plug that for whatever reason you know is is the one to replace the USB-C standard um, or plug and uh, to be able to recognize that for what it is progress potentially um, and to be able to adopt that and and enforce that I think is really critical to something like that so that is a fantastic point. But I support this. I'm I'm for it. Of course, I'm you know I'm I don't have phones that don't have USB C. So maybe that's part of the reason why I do. But uh, I think USB C is pretty great. So I'm happy with that. All right, coming up next, uh, we're gonna do some hardware. That's hardware coming up next. <laughs> All right. Well, speaking of the EU, uh, Microsoft unveiled the Surface Duo 2 last week. Um, we've been talking about the Surface Duo a lot in the upcoming Surface Duo 2. Um, most press outlets seem to agree that the device covers the shortcomings of last year's original Duo. Uh, the camera system is way better with a triple rear, rear camera array compared to the original single camera. You got two 5.8-inch 1344 by 21 uh, by 21. 
which number is that? There's an extra number in there. Uh, 2189. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> um, resolution, yeah, uh, 90 hertz displays inside, uh, which is a faster refresh from last year. It also includes a, sil- a sliver of display on the outside hinge for notifications. Um, it's got a Snapdragon 888 inside, uh, where last year's was the dated 855 chip with 8 gig of RAM, which is a lot of RAM. That's great. It also now includes NFC. Still no wireless charging. Um, it's going to be available on October 21st for $1499.99. So $1,500, uh, you can get the Surface Duo 2. But the big news is that not only is the Surface Duo 2 shipping with Android 11, but the original Surface Duo will be getting Android 11 by the end of the year, um, which is, I know, a thing that a lot of people were complaining about. Um, so, yeah, so Microsoft Surface Duo 2, it looks pretty good. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I The price tag gets me, but the device sure is yeah. fun. Right. I know. I know the $1,500 price tag is, is, uh, that gets me too. Uh, I just feel like these foldables need to come down in price, but, but at least now, you know, once again, at least we're getting foldables. If they, if they've got to be $1,500, at least put the, the top of the line, like current processor on the inside so that these things can survive, you know, uh, more than just a year or two. Uh, you know what I mean? At least then it feels to, to me, it just felt wrong to get like a foldable and spend fifteen or eighteen hundred dollars for a foldable cutting edge technology in hardware alone. But then you know what? But then there's certain aspects of it that are so far dated that it never really. It felt it's like it. It's like a Jekyll and Hyde situation. It feels like you know cutting edge on one hand and totally dated on the other, and that just never felt right. So fifteen hundred dollars, you're getting a phone that's you know more or less, as far as I can tell, pretty top of the line. That that justifies the cost a little bit, but I still feel like fifteen hundred dollars is too much for foldables. I don't know how you feel about yeah. that, Michelle. Um, what do you think? So I definitely think it's a little too expensive. Still, I mean, I think you'll see most people agree that um, for what's on offer, it's not worth getting over the Galaxy Z Fold three. Even though Microsoft has made significant improvements across the board. They finally made hardware worthy of actually picking up. Um, whereas before, the, the original Surface Duo was a travesty of hardware yeah, yeah, and software, actually. Software was probably the biggest issue with the original Duo. And it remains to be seen if they've significantly improved on the software. I mean, they've added new features, but um, no one has actually had the significant hands-on time with the Duo to, to see you know, if, if it's not as buggy mess like before. Um, but... Yeah, it's it's still too early for most people to ever consider picking up like these thousand dollar plus foldables. On the other hand, the nine ninety nine Galaxy Z Flip three is pretty close to becoming a mainstream, like the first mainstream consumer foldable. Um, especially considering the deals and sales you can get through U.S. carriers and Samsung themselves. Yeah. Completely agree. And that that was exactly what I thought when uh, Samsung made the announcement of that device. I was like, all right, you've broken the the thousand dollar mark, you know, the sub thousand dollar mark. This thing looks nice. Uh, I could totally see people going into the store and be like, ah, I could spend, you know, eight or nine hundred dollars on a on a flagship device or I could spend a thousand dollars and get this fancy, you know, foldable thing that, that goes really small. Like it, ju- it just seems consumer friendly. It seems like a consumer friendly foldable device versus the other ones that really seem very niche and um, and everything. And I, and I do feel like the Surface Duo 2 kind of falls in that category, too. It's a it's a niche device. It's it hasn't proven itself yet as far as like. You know, th- no question, there are people that are really excited about it, and they should buy this device and use it and love it. Um, you know, it, it supports the uh, Microsoft's pen. There's a lot of really great things about it, uh, but it's still a niche device, and it's a, yeah. you know. But that, that but that said, here's the thing, though. We said the same thing about Samsung's foldables two years ago. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Right. That that they were that they were niche devices that they were overpriced that average users couldn't afford them and now here we are and they kind of seem affordable and hot hot items. One one of them does. Yeah, one <laughs> the other one does. still right. feels pretty pretty out That's of the, the realm of, of but, reality. But no, but, but 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 so if Microsoft can 
get some traction with this and then get the cost of production that like the server, the, you know, if they can get the surface duo three sub 1000, this becomes, I think more of a player. Totally. No question. Yeah, yeah, if the, if yeah. Microsoft had announced the surface duo two and said, and it's $999, I'd be, I'd be singing a different tune right now. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, this, does, this to me is a thousand dollar device, maybe, maybe yeah. a little bit more just because it, it, it does go a little bit larger, but not much more like that. That really seems a lot more fair, but yeah, you know, I, it's not my job to price hardware, I guess. What do I know? Well, I mean, <laughs> if, if it is, it needs it, to be, what's that? If it is your job, if it is your job, Jason, you, you've been lax on it. So you need to get <laughs> yes, on Yes, I need to get to work. <laughs> well, Burke says that this device needs to be either five from between five to $700. So you know, Burke's going for the for the bargain basement. To be on, uh, <laughs> I would buy it at that price. Okay, <laughs> it would be very successful, I think, if they sold it for that price. Might might uh, you'd be could, losing money, yeah. but yeah, you can buy the original Surface Duo at that price just just because of how few <laughs> units oh, no, sold. They've you. just been slashing they the price can, left they can and right. Keep that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's if if the major uh, problem with the original was software. They'll probably do some tweaks to the software with the Android 11 release. So who knows? You could take a chance, buy it for five to seven hundred dollars, and cross your fingers that they fix all the problems in software. Uh, I'm not certain that that's a good idea, but it's an option. There yeah, you go. It is an option. <laughs> so I want to take a quick moment and uh, do a quick review of some uh, true wireless earbuds that I've been playing around with for a while. I get a decent amount of these. These are actually notable because they're inexpensive. The Wise Buds Pro I've been playing around with. Now, $59.99 is the price that I was uh, briefed on. And actually, there's a lot of reviews for these in the $59.99 category, which is a really great price for these earbuds. Their site has them list listed right now in the $70 range. I can't remember what it is, $75.99 or something, um, which is a little higher than what I think they should be. I don't know what's going on there, but I'm going to assume that you're paying $59.99 because that's what you should be paying for these. Um, and at that level... They're inexpensive, um, but you get some really nice features. You get the noise cancellation. So it has noise canceling, um, uh, active noise canceling in these. And, uh, you know, it's in this price category, you're not going to get like top of the line noise cancellation, but it's surprisingly effective. I thought that the low end cancellation, some of the mid range noise, uh, it actually did a pretty good job uh, of canceling. But Again, you're not getting that full seal kind of um, experience that you might get on the uh, higher end uh, earbuds. I find them to be a comfortable fit. Of course, you know, that really just depends on on your individual ear and everything. So they are the sealing kind that, that you know, it seals into your ear canal, the kind that Ron does not care for. But as you can see, uh, it has the kind of AirPods uh, kind of dangle uh, style to it. It is a slippery plastic, something definitely to keep in mind. I find it kind of slippery. Also, not to mention like it's, it's a little fiddly getting out of the case. It can be kind of hard to pull these out because it's so slippery, um, which is a minor quibble, but it's definitely something that I noticed uh, time and time again. It's, you got to be kind of careful pulling these things out. I wish I had the Pixel Buds um, A-Series case with me because this is kind of a dead ringer for it, except for the fact that it opens horizontally instead of uh, vertically. But, um, but it's a nice case. It's got wireless charging, so the, the case actually does support wireless charge. As we were talking about earlier, USB-C is, is awesome, and uh, it has USB-C for a fast charge as well. The case is not waterproof, but the earbuds themselves are IPX4 water resistance. So that's, that's like a light water resistance, sweat, so you can work out with these, light rain, although you probably want to make sure that these are dry when you put them back into the case because the case isn't, isn't waterproof. And you've got the little LED here that tells you, you know, the, the condition of your case, what it's charged to and everything um, like that. Um, decent battery life out of these. I, you know, I only ran these with uh, noise cancellation on. I'd say I got around five, uh, four to five hours of, uh, of duration of use before the batteries died on these with ANC on. Now, if you had that on, you're probably looking at more like six hours. That's what they rated at. But I just use these with uh, that noise cancellation on because why the heck not? I go for it. You know, that's how I roll. 
Uh, sound wise, you know, the majority of my listening right now is podcasts and audiobooks, which it, of course it's perfectly fine for. But when you listen to music with these, you actually get kind of like a hyped low end experience. So they definitely are not a neutral sound experience. You get a little bit more of that emphasized low end, which can really work well for some uh, musical styles. So, you know, uh, you either love that or you don't. And, uh, so that's something to keep in mind. They do have an app that gives you some minor adjustments, um, but you don't have like a full EQ control. So you are a little bit uh, limited as far as that's concerned. Um, but I thought they sounded, you know, especially for $59.99, they sounded uh, pretty nice. Uh, never really pushed into distortion. Things stayed relatively clean. By no means audiophile earphones, but they do support Bluetooth 5. Um, AAC, SBC codecs. They do not support Aptex, unfortunately. And then uh, I would say that some of the downsides would be touch controls, a little wonky. Right out of the box, a single tap does nothing, which I found really odd. Usually the standard is like a single tap would be play, pause, answer call, and these don't do anything out of the box. You can set that in the app so it's not the, the deal breaker, but it's just kind of weird. You have to do double tap to do all those things, and... Uh, I don't know. It was just a little finicky. It goes against the standard that I guess I'm used to, which is, you know, not the end of the world, but it is what it is. Um, anyways, these are the Wise Buzz Pro. Uh, you know, if you're if you're looking to not spend very much for in ear buds, and particularly uh, true wireless buds that support active noise cancellation, I mean, fifty nine ninety nine for for this kind of uh, ANC is actually a pretty awesome price kind of hard to find other options in this price. You could pay 20 bucks more, maybe get a better quality ANC. Um, but I think this is pretty great for 60 bucks, 75, 80, like the way it is on the site. I don't know. I would, I mean, it's, it's, there's still great buds, but, um, there are other earbuds that fall in that price category that you compare them to. So I wouldn't automatically just jump right into these. I would, uh, weigh your options. I don't know why the website has them listed as a little bit more expensive. That is very strange, but, uh, they should be 59.99. That's the wise buds pro Michelle. Are you a, uh, a, a, true wireless earbud connoisseur or fan? Like, is that what you listen with? I know Ron, you really don't, but, uh, what about you, Michelle? Um, I wouldn't say I'm a connoisseur. I do use them pretty often. Um, is they're more convenient to use than wearing headphones, bulky headphones all the time. Yeah. Uh, so I do have a few pairs of true wireless earbuds around. Yeah. Nice to have an option uh, hanging out uh, with these. As long as you have them all charged up, as long as you have the case charged up, that's that's the one thing you got to remember. That's, to and do that's that. what ha and that's so funny. Is that, so I tra I traveled this past weekend. I was you know, and I had, I was on flights and and went for runs and stuff like that. And I think that like the number of times I went to get my OG Pixel Buds and that they were completely not charged. I was like, damn it, you know. And like so, yeah. and luckily it charges quickly. I could get thirty percent in, and I can go for a, a good you know five mile run on thirty percent battery. But like you know, it happened last night. I was sitting in the sitting in the terminal. I wanted to watch a movie. A movie on my tablet and uh, uh, doesn't have a, a headphone jack, and so I went, opened up my yep. Pixel Buds and they were dead. And I was like, oh, oh forget it. Yeah, so yeah, it's a uh, yeah, it is a bummer. But I've totally been there. All right, Ron, oh, you got the last one. I do. <laughs> Um, so Michelle, you had another exclusive, um, but this time focused on the Pixel 6 Pro's camera features. Um, top of the list has to be the Magic Eraser, aka the fence remover might actually happen. Um, of course, face to bl blur, which Google's already acknowledged. Um, but Michelle, what is there to know about the camera support for 4K, 4K 60 versus 4K 30 video recording? Um, what, what did you, what did you find in, in looking in, into that? So after asking my source who has a real Pixel 6 Pro a bunch of questions, um, I found out that the Pixel 6 Pro will support 4K 60 video recording from the main rear camera only and 4K 30 from the other three cameras, which are the ultra wide angle, the telephoto and the front camera. Okay. And do we think that uh, that's enough to put us over the edge with this? You know, like is like is that right? is that in line with what we expected, or um, falling short, or over delivering? 
Well, I think people were kind of hoping to see 4K 60 on all three of your camera lenses and the ability to swim to seamlessly switch between all three while recording. Um, from what I've heard, you can seamlessly switch between all three lenses while doing 4K 30 recording. But since the other two lenses on the rear don't support 4K 60, you obviously can't do the same when recording uh, at that resolution. locked in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that could be that could pose a problem. Right. I don't know so, if I'm doing a whole lot of 4K 60 frames per second recording, but I guess that's just me. Uh, you know, I'm sure and there also are a lot of people out there who are future proofing all of the stuff that they're recording. I don't know. And also the need to switch between the two. You know what I mean? Like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, but I could see that. But so, Michelle, will there be Bluetooth mic support in the camera app? So that's one feature that is not confirmed because it's not present in the current version of the Google camera app that the Pixel 6 Pro ships with. It's hinted at in the code that it's yep. in the works, but the feature is not enabled yet. Got it. Um, that would be that would be nice if it was. That's for sure. Um, yeah, no but kidding. then that would be sweet. And then, yeah, that would be very cool. Um, and lastly, uh, what exactly is baby mode based on <laughs> what you found in talking to your source? And <laughs> it turns everybody in front of the camera into a baby. Of course, is that That's true? What it does. Uh, no, no, no. Can you confirm that? <laughs> <laughs> So from what I can tell, um, my source has no idea because it's not included in, as a mode in the camera app right now. I discovered it while digging through the code of the Google camera app. And from what I can tell, it seems like Google is adding a whole bunch of new recognized activities to um, the feature previously called Photo Booth, which I believe now just doesn't have a name. It's just called Auto Capture. Um, it's the feature where you enable it and then you walk in front of the camera and then the camera will automatically take a photo whenever it recognizes you doing something like you do a jumping jack or you smile or you, um, I don't know, you're running through the frame. And it looks like Google is adding a whole bunch of activities that will automatically trigger a photo being taken. And some of them seem to be related to babies, like babies playing around or you playing with the baby. Um, so... It seems like, you know, if you have a kid and you want to take like a photo of a precious memory of you playing around with them or just fix the camera while the baby's crawling around on the floor, maybe the Pixel 6 will automatically take those photos for you. It's almost like uh, a Google Clips. Clips. I was just going to I was just going to say the same thing, which which I'll be honest. I kind of wish I had bought one of those Google clips because, and I'm sure I could probably get them online or whatever, but with kids running around my house and like not catching moments and things like that, I, I have thought, I'm like, oh man, I wish I had an always on kind of camera to capture these great moments. Um, especially like every time, cause I, you know, it's funny because like Jason, I, you were on the, you know, kind of on the border with your kids. I'm curious, you know, my sister yeah. was, you know, my sister has teenagers now, but you know, when they were babies, it was still camcorder world and she has all this great camcorder footage of the of the, the kids as babies every time i take out my phone my kids stop what they're doing like they, they, yeah. my, oh, my yeah. daughter my daughter my daughter was singing it's was singing it's a bit itsy bitsy yeah exactly was singing itsy bitsy spider and i wanted to get that on video because i don't have it on video and she immediately stopped and wanted to video call somebody yeah. or wanted to look at pictures and it's like and it's like no like i i can't figure out how to get them to not acknowledge like how do i how do i subtly hold the camera the phone so that and and also i'm trying to shoot with my phone in landscape not portrait because i don't i don't i don't want vertical video in my archives so it's just like oh it's a mess but yeah you're a dying breed ron richards yep <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i i remember that exactly uh with my with my kids i have many a video where i started shooting my daughter savannah when she was you know very young and the second I hit record, she stops whatever she's doing. Goes, I see, I see. Like I want to see, and I'm like, ah, dang it, that that's not the thing I wanted to shoot. Um, I did a quick search for you though, Ron, and I found Google Clips 16 gig on uh, eBay for 60 bucks, brand new. So, oh wow, you know, you still you still that's can. Tempting. That's tempting. <laughs> One viewed per hour, so they're a hot item. <laughs> yeah, everybody's in the market. Uh, ooh, there's another one for 140 bucks. Why? Why? It's like it's the like the same thing. Like, can you find the uh, Nexus Q? 
Uh, yeah, well, well, I'm sure there's an XSQ on eBay. Yeah. There must be, yeah. How much do those go these days? Always a low ball one, and there's always a high ball one. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Well, there's a buy now for 60, 35 bucks. Yep. That's about it. Yeah. A plan program. Uh, yeah. Then there's a bunch of random stuff with Nexus Q in the title as well. But there are a couple, 35 bucks. Um, or you can visit my office uh, that I'm not in right now because of COVID and I have an Nexus Q. Oh, uh, it's not there anymore. Oh, no. You sold it on eBay, didn't you, Brooke? Currently selling, yes. Uh, okay. It's one of the ones that I just looked at, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. I see how you roll. All right. Uh, we actually have a little bit more hardware coming up next. All right. So we don't need to play the bumper. Um I'm throwing this in here because last week we were talking about how the note might come back. That was based on uh, some credible-ish leaks to that effect. This is, we're talking, of course, about the Galaxy Note series. The note seems to be this like this hot potato that, that bounces back and forth between, no, it's completely done, or yeah, it's coming back, or whatever. Now we've got the like the combined thing. The note according to on leaks is it on leaks yeah on leaks is not coming back but the note is coming back as the s22 ultra so <laughs> apparently uh and and uh ron amadio at ars technica wrote about this but you can see the photo there supposedly this render is of the upcoming galaxy s22 ultra and if you look really close at that bottom shot there you can see a little docking port for an s pen so it kind of seems Ooh. like what Google's, what, uh, sorry, what Samsung's strategy has been is, you know, they had mentioned, uh, you know, making room for the different class of, of flagship devices, the foldables. Then the foldables are now happening when the note used to happen. So now you've got the foldables as the later in the year, the S series in the earlier part of the year. But instead of getting rid of the note entirely that used to be the later part of the year, they're just bringing that into the top of the line S model. They kind of did that this year, but um, you know, at least it supported the S Pen, but you needed a case. And it's just kind of, you know, it's just not the same thing. For, for true note aficionados, they're not going to be satisfied with a floppy case that you attach to your note that, that also kind of holds the S Pen. They want the integrated experience. And so it kind of seems like, according to OnLeaks... Uh, that this is what we have uh, to look forward to is a notish Galaxy S22 Ultra. That makes a lot of sense yeah. to me. They should have called it the the Samsung Galaxy Note-ish. 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 No, the Galaxy Note light. No, no take a light, note-ish. light. Uh, take, take note-ish. note-ish. Ooh. <laughs> no, notice the note-ish. Note-ish. I like it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think that, um, I think this would be important too because the current like Taking the Z Fold 3 as the replacement note never sat well with me. Like, it's nice that you can do an S Pen, you know, the special S Pen on the inside, but it's just not the same thing as like, oh, I've got something, pop out the thing and, you know, the S Pen and write on the front of the screen quickly. Like, it's still too fiddly to do that with the Z Fold and kind of delicate because it's so big. They, they need this device. I think I think this makes a lot of sense to me. And I would love to see it. So there we go. All right. All right. Let's, uh, we do have a couple of app stories. Let's jump into apps. All right. Well, so I got a very ominous email today from Google, from YouTube, explaining why I might be losing NBC on or NBC's channels or uh, NBC Universal's channels on YouTube TV. Um, turns out, uh, uh, you know, and, all, and, and turns out NBC Universal and YouTube and Google have been negotiating and they're reaching the deadline and they're not quite there. Uh, NBC Universal has been warning subscribers of this due to the ongoing contract dispute with Google. In today's email from YouTube, they also explain that they've been trying to negotiate with NBC Universal and have not uh, found a spot for it. In fact, I should pull up the email and I can tell you exactly what they said um, because I thought it was interesting because they do cite Peacock um, on there. Where did it go? Um, it's very hard to find all your email on Gmail now. They pushed it all the way to the bottom. All right, here it is. So YouTube TV. 
Uh, we know that you love watching a, a wide variety of live sports news and shows available on YouTube TV. TV. That's why I've been working hard to renew our deal with NBC Universal to continue and carrying content. Since our agreement expires on Thursday, September 30th, we've not been able to reach an equitable agreement. We want to give you an early heads up so you understand our choices. Our ask is that NBC Universal treats YouTube TV like any other distributor. In other words, for the duration of our agreement, YouTube TV seeks the same rates that services of a similar size get from NBCU. So we continue offering YouTube TV to, to members at a competitive and fair price. If NBCU offers the equitable terms we're asking for, we will renew our agreement. However, if we're unable to reach a deal by Thursday, they'll no longer be available and they'll decrease the monthly price of YouTube TV from $64.99 to $54.99. Um, and then they said at that time you can sign up for NBC Universal's own streaming service, Peacock Premium, which they offer at four ninety nine a oh. month to continue to continue watching that stuff. Which is funny because you know they get a cut from that, right, from going through the Google Play yeah. Store and that purchase. Yeah, so it's kind of a win win. But um, but so yeah, so basically uh, what this means is that if you're on YouTube TV and you like NBC, Sci Fi, USA, Bravo, Telemundo, any of the NBC sports channels, those are all going to go away. Um, and to that's be honest, that's, that's, it's, it is huge. I mean, it's a major, I mean, NBC universal is a major kind of corner mm -hmm. of the content kind of world. Uh, um, that said, good thing Flo is not here because I know she's a big Bravo and all the trash TV on that, on that channel. Um, I would not miss any of this and I would, I would like a $10, uh, drop in my monthly price. So I'm actually fine with this. Um, so, and this is, and this is the whole thing. It all goes back to, why YouTube TV has to be one flat monthly rate for everything and why they don't a la carte it and let you create the package that fits, that suits you. But, um, what can you do? Because, um, because there's like five or six media conglomerates that own every single channel out there and they're all, yeah. they're all kind of in the same boat of, of making that impossible. Yeah. You know? Yep. And, and this all stems from apparently whatever NBC Universal is trying to get YouTube uh, to do with Peacock and to force Peacock into the, into its ecosystem. Um, you know, cause NBC Universal has invested a lot into Peacock and a lot of their content is there. Um, but again, it's customer choice and, and you, NBC Universal should feel as important to pr make their content available to users who choose YouTube TV as those who choose Peacock. Um, so I don't know. Yeah. Oh, the street, hmm. the streaming wars have many casualties, so. man. <laughs> and I wonder if we would see this, if Peacock didn't exist, if NBC, yeah, no, a hundred percent, you wouldn't hundred percent. It, it, yeah. This is all motivated by NBCU trying to get people to adopt Peacock and they're just trying to make Peacock happen. So, right. And they've got, you know, they've, they're, uh, Im embattled with sling as well. So there's a, there's a little common a common theme going on here. Uh, do you, do you, uh, Subscribe to any of these online streaming services, Michelle. What, what's your take on this? Oh boy, um, I only subscribe to Netflix Prime Video and Disney Plus right now. Um, that's I, a good. That's a good. I, combo. There's just two. That's a pretty common combo. There's yeah. just way too many streaming services nowadays. It there feels is. like we're we're going back to the days of cable TV. Yeah, totally. I mean, I guess the the. The upside here is that, you know, and a lot of people do this, you drop into a service in order to get the things that you want for like a month or two. And then you drop out and go to another thing, you know, another service because they all have their like premier shows or premium shows and you don't have to stay there the entire time. Right. Like you could drop into Netflix for a couple of months and catch right. up on all the important things that you, that you find there or whatever, and then drop that and go over to HBO max for a couple of months or whatever. So there's some, there's some benefit there, I suppose, but yeah, it really is. It, it's kind of complicated and actually pretty expensive. <laughs> it is what it is. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, it's the streaming. Um, one. The stre no one, no one is winning in the streaming wars. That's the problem. Yeah. I, no, I'll, I'll be honest. The, the, no, the people who are winning in the streaming wars are, you know, the the big conglomerates, and who's losing right. are the the consumers. So yeah. right, right. Yes, indeed. Um, and then finally, before we get to our emails and such, uh, Google's next messaging frontier. That's right. Brace yourselves. Google Calendar is getting messaging. Although this time it's not it's not like Google Calendar's own like <laughs> own siloed messaging. <clears throat> Apparently Google Calendar is uh, is integrating Google Chat. So they're, you know, they're really boosting up their workspace suite. This is kind of a part of that. There's going to be a chat, a Google Chat button being added to every calendar event. Thank God. 
for <laughs> attendees next to the mail, the mail icon. So, so essentially like if you're going to be running late to a meeting or whatever, you, yes, you could send a mail by opening up that event and, and clicking on mail and sending mail to everybody that's there. Or you could just jump into a quick Google chat and send them and say, Hey, I'm going to be five minutes late or whatever. Uh, something like but that. But who's so, in the, who's in the chat to hear that? Like that, this that's is a, so well fundamentally flawed. <laughs> I mean, I, well, I don't know. Like I'm not, ne I'm not necessarily actively in my Google chat app, but when my wife sends me a Google chat, like I get it, I get notified well, about it. And I think, well, no, actually, actually, now that I, now that I say this is probably directly tied to a Google meet meeting, right? Because in Google meet, there is a chat window, like there is in zoom and other, you know, kind of platforms or whatever. So if it, if it pushes that note to that chat of people in that meeting, then that's great. The, but what happens when it's not a Google meet meeting? I mean, what I what I understand it to be is that when it's not in a Google Meet meeting, you're just you're sending a Google chat to everybody else in in that um, right. that has you know confirmed for that meeting to their Google chat instance, and so it's just a messaging yeah. app. Like I would get a notification from so and so saying, "Oh, they're going to be five minutes late." That's that's all it would be. Yeah. I mean, it would be the same thing as if I was sending them an SMS message each each individually, except it's right. through Google now, Chat. I, don't know, I will share. A behind the scenes frustrated comment by Burke via our behind the scenes chat where he says they took away doc chat and gave us this. Fair. Fair. Yeah. Just fair. Although yeah. doc chat is there if you're in your personal, it's just not no, if you're in your workspace it's gone. account. No, it's it's gone. Is it? It's, it's so now so now if you click on what used to be the chat, it says comments and start oh, a discussion, so you can add a comment and it's comments tied to cells in a spreadsheet. There's no chat anymore. Oh wait, no, no, no there is chat. No, I found it. it I found is. it. It's back. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, yeah. But, but it's only a personal account. Like, you know, I'm usually right. signed into my, my, um, the, my workspace the G through Twitter. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, so as a result, I don't end up seeing the chat. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And why is that? Why, why is there two, you know, the same, the same app, but it's two so different silly. rules as far as chat is concerned. It doesn't make any sense to me. So, silly. um, where where do you fall on the chat and calendar <laughs> side of things, Michelle? Do you think Google's doing like I, I I actually look at this and I'm like, okay, well at least they're following their standard a little bit. They're not creating another thing that's siloed off. This is kind of like what I would hope Google would do with their services. Mm -hmm. But uh, what do you think, Michelle? So as a standalone messaging service, chat is absolutely terrible. It's one of the worst <laughs> messaging services I've ever used compared to things like Telegram, yeah. Discord, WhatsApp, etc. But I do have to give Google credit as they're finally doing something smart with their messaging strategy in that they're leveraging the power of the Gmail brand and they're integrating Meet and Chat into it seamlessly. You don't even have, even have to have Chat or Meet installed. It's all bundled into Gmail itself. And I really like the direction they're going with that because it makes those services immediately accessible to anyone with a Gmail account, which is like practically everyone. Right. And same goes for Google Calendar. You know, Google Calendar is not as ubiquitous as Gmail, but it's probably the most used calendar service like on the web. So by integrating chat into it, it's another clever way to get people to use it. Yeah. And I hope Google continues in this direction. Like instead of building instead of some like you know engineering team deciding to spin off its own messaging service build something that integrates neatly into your core services yeah totally agree totally agree and this seems like a step in the right direction as far as that's concerned is chat the best app in the world like like you said and i totally agree no it's not but um if if they double down and, and just make that the kind of the the streamlined location that all of these chats happen through, at least it's less confusing for for me, the user. I know where my messages are. They're in that one place. They're not in a million different places scattered around. So uh, Burke seems to love chat. By the way, he's going off about it right now. Uh, in in Slack of all places, not on Google Chat. I might add, he's not going off on it in Google Chat. He's going off on it in Slack. There you go. Confusing. All right. Up next. Oh, ironic. <laughs> I know, isn't it? <laughs> up next, we've got your emails. 
Yeah, so we got some emails, AAA at twit.tv. And yes, some of them are a little long because we're just getting lots of long emails lately. So I try and sometimes I try and snip them down. So if you send in a longer email and I have the time, I'll edit them down to kind of shorten them for short show length. And so if I get rid of like your favorite part, I'm sorry, but you know, we're doing the best we can. Nick R wrote in to say, for me, one of the biggest headaches with smart devices is controlling them. I, I would agree with that. I have a Google Assistant device in every room in my house, but sometimes I just don't want to talk. I just want to hit a button. I loved when Google added device controls to the power button. It was easy and quick, so of course Google had to change it. The notification bar solution is fine, but not as easy to do one-handed with a bigger phone. I'm on Android 12 beta and was excited when I found out the device controls was on the lock screen uh, until I tried to use it. I have a Pixel 4 XL with face unlock and have always been impressed with how quickly it unlocks my phone. I have too. Until now, I never get a chance to use the lock screen device controls because the phone unlocks before I can even hit the device controls button. Was it really such a big issue having the device controls on the power button? Google has always been about options and customization. Couldn't they just give me the option to have it on the power button? I'm glad I got that off my chest. Thanks, AAA. You're welcome. Anytime, Nick. Um, I totally agree. Um, although, like, I've got it on my lock screen here. I guess I can... Here, let's see here. Do I have it on my lock screen? Oh, and I don't know that I do, actually. Uh, I thought I did. No, it's not appearing for me, so I won't show you. But um, I've had it there, and, you know, old habits die hard. It's, it's hard for me to, to remember to go there when I need it. I, I just really liked it on the power, the power button, really. Um... That was my preference too. So I wish it would go back there. There, There's a bug r report or something on the, on the Google site that um, months ago when Android 12 beta started, uh, someone in the chat room linked me to it and they were like, well, you're complaining about this. Why don't you actually like get on the thread and, and put in your voice? And I did. And all I ever get from that is daily notifications of other people that are, are tagging onto it. But it seems like this is this change is here to stay. So don't know what to tell you about that, Nick. Um, well, and, and Michelle, you've had probably more experience with Android 12 beta than any one of us. Um, what do you, how do you feel about this like relocation of the device controls? Does it bug you at all? Do you not care? How do you feel? So I personally really liked the way the power menu in Android 11 is set up with the device controls integrated directly into it. I use it pretty much every day to control the lights um, in yeah. this room, in my bedroom, et cetera. Um, so I really do miss the the power menu integration. Um, I don't think having a shortcut on the lock screen is, is the exact same thing. Um, but, you know, at least it's there. Google at least did provide some replacement shortcut yeah um i'm more interested in finding out why there was a shift from the power menu to you know the simplified power menu in android 12 i'd like to hear internally what happened i there's probably some interesting discussions involving samsung and probably like the assistant team wanting to push assistant further by making the power button um, launch assistant in 12 uh, there's probably some interesting discussions we'll never see the light of day, but uh, I think that's probably what's more interesting to me. I, I think I, I would like to know what uh, the assistant team has on all the other teams at Google that they are getting so much leeway across the board. Because, I mean, not to bring it back to our, you know, YouTube music uh, Google home problems that I have, but like, you know, but the thing is, is that like so much is being funneled to the assistant. We understand that, you know, Sundar has talked about it and we, we, we've seen the presentations where assistant is the backbone of everything they do, but it seems like they are forcing it in places that it is overforced. So my opinion, at least what do you think, Jason? Yeah. I mean, well, what I was, what I was looking at as I was kind of thumbing through the power button now when I pulled it up, so this is the simplified power button on Android 12 beta, uh, you know, compared to the the one that we had before where it had the buttons up the top, it had the Samsung Pay, and then it had the device controls down at the bottom. And like part of me wonders if this has something to do, at least at least a piece of it has something to do with the new redesign. It really kind of has that bubbly approach. 
you know, I don't know that it's necessarily going to pull in uh, the material you, but if what they were looking to do, it, it, like a part of me thinks that when I look at this, it kind of, it kind of uh, resembles a little bit of that widget style approach of what we're going to see coming up here pretty soon. And, you know, maybe it was that, maybe they're like, well, why can't the power button be aesthetically kind of match the design of everything else that's coming but I don't, you know, as opposed to being like this page full of like three different things you can do with it, power stuff, payment stuff, and control stuff. Um, but I don't know that Google would necessarily drive its design decisions entirely around the aesthetic choice like that. Maybe they would, but I, but I could see it being a, a component of it, a part of the decision anyways. But I don't know. It's just it's less useful. You know, the power button is is less useful now than it was. And I I it just worked for me where it was before. So so there you go. Change All right, Ron, changes cha changes challenges. Change sure. Change change is is hard. Hard. All right. Our next I email think, Oh, sorry, F oh, you. Sorry. I just wanted to add one thing. I think yeah. sure. maybe what happened is that um Android actually tracks the uptime of the device so you can tell how long it's been since it's been last rebooted and i'd wager that very very few people a actively reboot their devices even once a week if at all um so maybe google saw that if very few people are rebooting the devices how many people are ever seeing the power menu on their device in the first place so mm. if this power menu oh, gesture good. is being unused why not change it to something that people might actually use much more frequently which is calling the google assistant yeah, or I mean, I mean, placing it on a lock screen that you see every single time you go to use your device. You know, if that feature is activated, <laughs> I you know stupidly had it deactivated and couldn't and didn't didn't think to look in lock screen settings in order to find it and activate it. Flo had to point that out to me on the show, um, so I felt a little dumb about that. But if that's a feature that you have to actively, you know, turn on when the official release comes out. There's, it's still going to kind of be a little hidden unless somebody knows to knows to find it. But that's a really good point that that would that would encourage people to use that and interact with that more than, you know, you're right. Probably most people don't go into the power menu um, unless their device is borked and they need to restart it for some reason. They probably aren't going there. So good point. All, All right, right, Ron, you got the next one. Yes, our next email is a follow-up from John R., who's following up to his email last week about decks and lap docks, uh, which I find fascinating. And John says, I don't see a lap dock as a laptop replacement, but since I got mine, my laptop rarely leaves my office because 90% of my usage can now be done on the lap dock, and it is smaller, lighter, and has a decent keyboard. It handles emails, text, documents, and spreadsheets, and I can copy and paste between them in multiple windows. Taking the laptop means disconnecting from the second screen, the power supply, and the network cable, whereas the lap dock is ready to go, 10,000 milliamp battery. Uh, in many locations with a laptop, I have, um, I have to use the phone as a mobile hotspot and wait while the laptop syncs its data. The lap dock connects straight away as it's on mobile data. Of course, there's some apps that I need Windows for, Android Studio as I do some app programming, and SailWave, a sailboat results program. Uh, but Juan Bagnell makes the point that for many people, their phone is their only computer. The lap dock and Dex makes this much more viable, uh, which I got to say, and Jason, you can you can back me up here. Back the first time Samsung announced Dex, I was I, I was curious about it because mm -hmm. I do totally subscribe to the fact that we walk around with these computers in our hands and that for the most part, you know, saving a lot of like intense, you know, audio and video editing and things like that. Although you're more and more being able to do that on phones. So, you know, that, that might become antiquated, um, that essentially there is a lot to be done with your phone. If you use it as a computer and Dex seems to be able to make you be able to do that. Um, if Google rolled out a dock solution, a lap dock solution for pixel or whatever, I can't say I wouldn't use it. Um, I feel like the only thing keeping me from Dex and from really kind of, you know, kind of uh, getting behind it is that it's just all in the Samsung ecosystem, which I'm not a part it's of. It's a Samsung phone. But yeah. I, I, I find this right. really, really compelling. I find it really compelling. Yeah. yeah. Well, there you go. I mean, it, you know, makes the case for the laptop being something that like you store in your backpack. Your, your laptop is the thing that's at your office or, you know, wherever you work or whatever. And the lap 
dock is just meant to be your kind of portal in your go bag, always there because you're always going to have your phone. So if your lap dock really doesn't take up that much space, is pretty light, can stay out of the way, then you don't have to feel like you're bringing your computer everywhere you go because you've got that that you can just plug into if you really need that at some point. So yeah, that's a that's it's, a good use case. Really, really interesting. Really, really interesting. So yeah. So I actually somewhat disagree, but only in that. Um, the usability, like I wouldn't use a phone like connected to a laptop for my daily work, mostly because Android is still completely fundamentally um, inferior when it comes to actually using yeah. it like a desktop operating system compared to something Just like fair. Windows. You don't have okay. all the same keyboard shortcuts, the free form, the Windows like support. Windowing support is like half baked still. Samsung basically added a whole bunch of hacks on top to make it somewhat functional. But even so, if you compare it to something like the windowing system on Windows, it's just inferior. And so like when you're dealing with like multiple monitors and you want to have like 10 different Chrome tabs open, you want to like, you're researching articles, things like that, like the kinds of things that I do, I think I would get very annoyed very quickly at how much slowed down I'd feel doing all this on an Android laptop solution. Yeah. I mean, the times that I've used Dex, that's kind of been my experience is like, OK, this it, I appreciate that it does this. And I am certain that there right. are people out there that this works for. But this just isn't my ideal yeah. working situation. If I had to do this on like a daily basis, like I jump out the window. It's right. just not my it's just my not right. my cup of tea. Yeah. Uh, obviously, I, think, I think the hardware. Yeah. yeah, the hardware is definitely there. The, these yeah. lap docks are definitely portable enough. They're thin enough. They're light enough. Phones are powerful enough to handle all the multi- multitasking. It's just that Google needs to Google needs to step up and actually <laughs> give a damn about you know uh, desktop op- like desktop on Android or Android on desktops. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe uh, Google will have its own desktop experience uh, on an upcoming Pixel device or foldable or I don't know, who the heck knows it's uh i mean they did they did integrate some sort of desktop mode into android a few versions ago i remember doing a how-to on that on hands on android but i mean it was super rudimentary it was super basic it's so not yeah. not fully fleshed out by any stretch so uh thank you for writing in though love hearing about your perspective on this john and i'm sure i'm sure you're not alone i well i know you're not alone there's a lot of people who are probably listening to that and like yeah amen that's that's me too so thank you for writing in all right and now we have the email of the week And Rob F. is this week's email of the week. Wrote in an email a little more than like a week and a half ago, almost two weeks ago. And I didn't include it because it was so long. And then he followed up with a a much shorter version that was too short. (laughs) So then I was like, all right, you've got good points. So I'm just going to take the time and edit this down. So it is a little long. I edited it down a little bit. It's still a little long. uh, But I think it's, it's worth talking about. And I mentioned this earlier in the show, in fact. So... He says, I worked on Android tablets since day one, literally receiving Samsung tab prototype units glued into white plastic to develop a VoIP app uh, to embed for launch back in 2010, as well as designing universal apps for the Telegraph here in the UK using the dynamic frame, uh, fragments framework that was pushed in 2012, 2013. Back then with the Nexus 7, it felt like there was a bright future for Android tablets with some very smart people finding solutions to solve the issues developers had with developing for the platform. Progress was being made. So what happened? Chrome OS happened. And so this is where he gets into his conspiracy theory or the uh, Conspiracy might be the wrong word. This is this is what he's postulating might have happened. My conspiracy theory is that when Sundar Pichai became CEO, there was either an edict or an unwritten rule made clear that Chrome was was to be the OS used in future made by Google tablets. Rumors in 2015, when the Pixel C was launched, was that they wanted it to run Chrome OS, but couldn't get it oven ready, so plumbed for Android. Yes, I do remember that. Since then, they launched the Pixel Slate, and we know how that went. Yes, we do. 
It feels like it feels like this is another thing Google has retreated from uh, when the, with their short attention span uh, was waning. The crazy thing in this case, though, is that Google had a solid OS for tablets, but appeared to turn their back on their own work to avoid awkward internal politics. My circumstantial proof for this is the speed at which Google released a support framework for foldable devices back in 2018. That was the moment Samsung released the original Fold. Why so fast? Because there were Android teams in place with solutions banked for Android tablet support that they simply dusted off and rehashed for foldable. And not his words, my words. I do remember that. I remember the foldable kind of tweaks coming pretty fast and actually being somewhat impressed that Google was able to like recognize this foldable thing and be like, oh, we should uh, bake in some true support for this right away. Uh, so maybe there's some truth to this. Back to the email. It says, today I turned uh, my back on Android tablets and bought an iPad mini. Have not been able to recommend anything other than iPads for years. And when Google stopped direct support for tablets by switching off their own programs, every company I have worked for pretty much refuses to prioritize any dedicated development to make apps better for the platform. Ron, throw your new Lenovo tablet away. No one at Google HQ cares about making it a good device. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> I thought that and, was a funny I mean, way to end this, it. This, this dovetails with Michelle with your comments from earlier in the show, right? Yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah, so. yeah. I want so. I want tablets to be a thing. I want Google to care. I want I want uh, <laughs> I want this to not be uh, true. I guess. <laughs> do, do, okay, so. I guess what I'm thinking now is, so you, you just bought a, an Android tablet. It's a true Android tablet. You did have yes. the opportunity. You did have the potential of buying a Chrome OS slash Android tablet. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I, I cons considered that. You know what I mean? Like we considered all the different options and things like that. But I, I ultimately, I went for the standard Android tablet because that's what I've known. That's what I've been using. And like yeah. here it was. I was on the road and it was great. I, I was I read I read a book on it. I was watching video. It was yeah, everything was good. So yeah. Yeah. So then so then uh maybe this is a question for you, Michelle. Like Chrome OS as a tablet. I mean, I guess when I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking, all right, Android as a tablet hasn't worked by, you know, by not just a couple of people's estimation. A lot of people have felt this way. Maybe the Chrome OS is a tablet that also supports Android. Maybe that was Google saying, well, you know, if we can't make Android tablets sing on their own, this is how we add value. We do Chrome, which we know Chrome OS well, and we add Android support, and that's the extra value that comes with it. Do you, have they been successful in that? What, what's your take on that? Like, man, and I mean, maybe less from a market perspective, because it really doesn't seem like the tablets of, of Chrome OS and Android, you know, tablets are, are a, a huge success. But do you feel like Google has done a good job in kind of achieving that goal of, of making them useful? So the Chrome OS team has been developing many different like tablet specific features and interface optimizations over the last few years in parallel with, you know, ongoing Android development. And there are several Chrome OS tablets out there, like the, the Lenovo Chromebook, Chromebook Duet, I think, is one of the most popular ones. Mm -hmm. um, but like, I think the biggest problem with Google's focus on, you know, supporting specific kinds of hardware is that Oftentimes, you'll notice that they won't support specific hardware unless they have a plan in place to include that hardware in a future Pixel device, like a confirmed plan. So yeah, if we right. go back to how many years has it been since Android devices have had under-display fingerprint scanners? It's been like 2018 since those products have been around, right? Mm -hmm. When is Android, the open source version, officially adding support for under-display fingerprint scanners? Android 12. Guess what device has an under display fingerprint scanner? <laughs> Pixel 6. When did Android add support for Face ID hardware? Well, that was with the Pixel 4 launch. Yeah. Um, you can see this time and time again. Google often doesn't support specific hardware unless they have a product that's going to make use of it. And, and I mean, we're, it feels like, you know, we're right on the cusp of that again with the foldable and the news around exactly. uh, the, the Pixel foldables. Like, yeah. Yeah, it's a really, really good point. Seems to be their 
their operating procedure as far as that's concerned. And, it, yeah. and it's important to note again that when I was exploring the tablet purchase, the, the duet did come up as a really yeah. good, as an affordable option. And I kind of, I kind of wish I'd gone that route because it just to yeah. try something new, but I went with what I would, what, what looked like a beefier, uh, you know, kind of a, a more robust piece of hardware. Um, but man, that duet price is so cheap. I might just, I might just give it a shot just to, just to play with it. <laughs> then you got two, you've got, uh, yeah, you've got two right. kids, you've got two devices yeah. to hand down at some point. <laughs> If the devices last that long. Um, cool. Well, uh, great email, Rob. Um, he did mention, and I edited it out, but he did mention that uh, that he hoped he would get the email of the week. And you did get the email of the week, so congratulations. Oh, you see, Jason, I mean, I feel like that's an immediate uh, di you know, disqualifier. You can't hope for that. Well, well, I, I think you can hope for it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's, it's, you it's can cool hope for it. You don't it. say it. Yeah, you can't. You just, you can't, you just might not get it. Suggest it, right? It's, it's a, it's a, it's a very. Listen, Rob, it's a very prestigious thing. You let let your email stand on its own. Let us decide. <laughs> that's true. That's true. I will, I will say, Rob is not alone in in suggesting it. Now it's like a, a like a goal. It's a thing. Like, all right, I'm going to get those start, horns. We should we should figure out some way to like make something that they can get that says that they are the email of the week. That'd be cool. <laughs> a, cer a certificate. Yeah, a certificate yeah. that auto generates itself that we have nothing to do with it. All you just go, you right? Just yeah, go that, there. yeah, that, that it all, yeah, that we can like it's some sort of thing like it's a one use generation that you can print yes. or something like that. Yeah, I don't know. Here you go, hang it on your wall. Yeah. Congratulations, yeah. moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right. Well, that is it for this episode of All About Android. Always a lot of fun and always such a great time uh, having you on the show, Michelle. You're, you're a wealth of information and knowledge, and I love, I continue to love what you guys are doing at XDA. Uh, you're just, you're good at what you do. So thank you for hopping on with us today. Tell people where they can follow all of your work. I'm sure you have. I mean, maybe you can't talk about it, but I'm sure you have more exclusives coming <laughs> up your sleeve because you've got a really great contact. But if people want to follow everything you're doing, where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter at Michelle Rahman. And then xda-developers.com to follow right. all of their wonderful reporting. Cool, Michelle. Thank you again for taking time. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me on again. Absolutely. Uh, and then, Ron, you've got some news, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been talking about it for the past couple of weeks, but uh, the gang over at Scorbit has been very busy. And last week, we actually made a big announcement. Um, and it was great to see Russell Holly over at CNET covered it. It was pretty cool. Uh, but we rolled out our uh, Scorbit's Open Achievements platform, which basically brings uh, achievements to pinball machines. Uh, so what are achievements? It's basically uh, similar to like Xbox Live and other kind of things like that, where where if you're playing a game and you do something on the game, uh, you know, you get multi-ball 10 times, you get the multi-ball achievement or that sort of thing. Um, it basically gives new dimension to playing pinball and having fun with pinball games. And part of the announcement was that we uh, work very closely with Jersey Jack Pinball, uh, who uh, not only have Scorbit uh, integrated into their pinball machines at the uh, API level, so you don't need any additional hardware in there, but they are completely supporting and embracing our open platform for achievements and rolling out achievements across all of their games, starting with Willy Wonka, Guns N' Roses is next, that sort of thing. Um, and so really, really excited about it. Big news. Uh, so definitely go check out the new Scorbit app in the Google Play Store or go to scorbit.io to see all the information about it. Uh, but yeah, we it's, it, it was it was a big announcement uh, and was psyched to see so many people in the pinball uh you know, world really excited about it and understanding what it means, you know, like we're going to have like individual achievements. So you could have like the, you know, uh, the, like a, what we call a trophy achievement, kind of like mayorships on Foursquare where like, you know, if you have the most high scores at one bar, you're the only person with that achievement until someone knocks you off. Right. So it, like it's Perfect. taking, it's taking playing and taking it out of just like the single game and you can have multi game, you know, you know, achievements that span multiple games on the same machine or span multiple machines and that sort of thing. So there's so many dimensions that we can take with it. Uh, so really excited. We're working all summer on it. So glad to get it out there. Yeah. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thanks. I love, I Thanks. love seeing the continual evolution of score. Yeah. yeah. This was a big one. Yeah. This was a big deal. So yeah. So uh, right definitely on. check it out. 
Uh, and follow me on Twitter and on Instagram uh, at Ronxo. So there you go. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Congratulations, Ron. That's great. Um, Burke, Victor, both working hard to bring you this episode and every episode of All About Android, from switching the TriCaster to recording all the media to editing it and publishing it. It's a lot of work behind the scenes. So thank you to you both for that each and every week. Um, let's see here. I'm, uh, you know, I'm at Jason Howell on Twitter. You can find me on other uh, shows like Tech News Weekly twit.tv slash tnw sometimes filling in for leo last week i was on this week in google that was a lot of fun uh, just look on the twit.tv site and you'll see me on a number of shows uh don't forget club twit uh that rhymed mm, i didn't even try uh our ad free subscription tier all our shows with no ads also an exclusive twit plus podcast feed we throw tons of extra content in there. And there's also a members only Discord channel. Uh, cool stuff. Seven bucks per month. So seven dollars a month. Just go to twit.tv slash club twit and you can subscribe and be a part of uh, all that it offers uh, being a member of the club. But that's it for this week. We publish this show each and every Tuesday evening. Twit.tv slash AAA is the show place on the web where you can go to subscribe, audio, video, jump out to YouTube. Doesn't matter. As long as you're subscribed, then you don't even have to think about it. We will be delivered to you as if it were magic, which it is. That's the magic of RSS. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching and listening. We'll see you next time on All About Android. Bye, everybody. Good night. Bye. <laughs> if you find yourself talking to those virtual assistants in your house quite often, or maybe you can make your light turn on and off with the touch of a button, well, Smart Tech Today is the show for you. Join Matthew Casanelli and myself, Micah Sargent, every week as we talk all about smart stuff and the fun that comes along with it.